PID control. And I'm going to skip over the historic background and so on. You can read about that in the in the. So I'm going to focus just on the rudiments and the most basic part of PID. The reason why it's written in the in the shape that it is, is because the proportional mode is really the, the heart of the control. It's the thing that does most of the heavy lifting in this algorithm. And you'll remember that yesterday I had a control scheme over here and that controller box corresponds to the controller box that I just showed you uh, a real, well, a photograph of, right? The actual box. It's got... Um, it's got these links over here, so that reference input is kind of, let's say, the front of the screen. And you can imagine that that part of this box corresponds to the back of the box that I showed you, right? There's the place here for the measurement to come in, and there's a place there that gets connected to whatever makes changes. So this is why I drew this box in uh, the way that I drew it ye uh, yesterday. I'm going to fill in some extra stuff which makes this a formal block diagram now. And this is just the way that we model the calculations that are done inside of the typical controller box. Normally, we would do this. So... Typical feedback controllers, when we analyze the action mathematically, we always imagine that inside of that box there is a comparator. There's something that is trying to compare the reference signal or the set point to the current measurement. And for linear control systems analysis, we will always imagine that the controller is acting on the error signal. In other words, in terms of the math that we write down, we will never have a controller which has a block diagram where the measured signal enters into the controller. We will always only compare the error or the, we will always only act on the error. So in terms of control analysis in this subject, you can always write down that the controller input will always be the error and the controller output will always be the manipulated error. And so this is the first little step where we're moving beyond um, where we're moving beyond what we can um, just imagine that box, how that works on a high level. On a high level, the box, the function of the box seems quite obvious. You have to have the measurement going into the box. That's true. But from a mathematical level, we're going to have the error going into the transfer function. And you'll become very used to this standard control loop where we have the controller acting on the error, producing a manipulated variable, going into the plant, which reacts, produces something that we can measure, going back, being fed back, and compared to the reference signal, that's going to be the standard form of the loop that we're going to be analyzing. So, the first thing that we have to understand is that when we talk about proportional action, we will always think of this, always have this little calculation in mind, right? So we'll have an error which is always calculated in this way, where the set point is taken as the reference, and we subtract the measurement. And the kind of controller where, that we are designing right now is this thing over here. And so proportional control is easily represented by a simple gain. So proportional control doesn't have any dynamics inside of the system itself. And you'll see that uh, in the textbook, we are shown this relationship where we have that error signal, which they actually have as an epsilon, and we have the error signal 
And at some point, so they call the output over there P. And this point here is P bar. And actually, we should actually label this. You'll see the textbook has this labeled as P, but when you think about it, it's actually what we used to call in dynamics uh, P hat, right? It, it's the un, uh, or let's say, yeah, it's actually P because P, normally we would have that as P bar or P uh, accent or P prime. So this is what the controller, this is how it works. Now remember, in our analysis, we will always be analyzing these linear systems in deviation variable form. And so from a mathematics point of view, because you can imagine we actually have a transfer function if we were writing down PS is equal to K times epsilon S, right? That's what we would write down mathematically for that game. If we were writing that down, uh, an epsilon of zero would correspond to a p of zero. So how is it that we have this p bar? It's because the controller is taking action in the real world, right? And so while we do our calculations in deviation variables, we want to actually apply that in the real world, which means we have to add back that steady state value. Now, this is also known as the bias of the, of the controller. So, proportional control just works exactly like this. It says, if the error is, um, now this is, this, is the, this is a positive gain controller, right? And obviously the slope of that line is the, is the proportionality constant. And so the ideal version of this, the ideal version of this controller which we would add, be able to analyze with all the methods from CPN, the output is allowed to go up to infinity and down to minus infinity. But, obviously in the real world, realistic versions of that can't do that, right? So. Realistic versions of that have bounds. <clears throat> I want you to understand that. Maybe let me just write that next to this like this. Okay, so I want you to understand that here we already have a deviation from or between the theory, the simple mathematical equations that we write down, and the reality, which says, well, if that were a control valve, say. I cannot turn a control valve to negative fractions. I can close it all the way and that's as far as it goes, right? I can open it all the way and that's as far as it goes. And so already we realize the analysis that we'll be doing mathematically, if we were to use Laplace domain techniques or Z domain techniques to analyze these systems, we would be <laughs> making a mistake of this particular kind. We would be imagining or calculating that the controller could move the manipulated variable more than it can in reality. And it's important to understand this because we're going to be doing most of our analysis using those techniques. And so you have to understand the limitations of those techniques. Why do we feel okay doing that? The only reason why we feel okay doing that is because all systems are approximately linear within a small range around the point of linearization. And so you can imagine that the analyses that we're going to be doing are going to be more reliable the smaller the deviations are from some kind of ideal steady state. So if we're working approximately at some steady state, far away or at least as far away as we can from the bounds, if we're not reaching the bounds of the manipulated variable, the linear analysis will be more reliable. But also because the linear analysis is not 100% accurate, 
That basically is the reason why we have the project. Because during the project and in some of the other simulation types, we will be actually simulating the behavior of nonlinear systems. And so this kind of controller, which has limits, is actually a nonlinear controller. It's, and I mean, it's a bit confusing because it's not nonlinear because it uh, doesn't look like a straight line. Uh, it's nonlinear because of those limits, right? Um, because obviously the action of these controllers don't always uh, resemble straight lines. So I think it's useful to imagine uh, what these things look like when we actually run them in time. Um, uh, let's see. Right, so uh, we've got a proportional only controller running on the TC lab. Uh, I'm saying it's proportional only because uh, we have, uh, I've uh, set the value of tau i to be quite high. And so we can see uh, a proportional move uh, and only a very small amount of interval action which, is a pro which uh, corresponds with this um, error integral that's being added on over here. Now we can see under these conditions uh, with a small gain we are not actually uh, converging uh, towards the set point. So we can, we can make that happen a little bit faster by uh, increasing the gain. With a larger gain, we are going to see a larger manipulated variable move and um, a corresponding larger um, increase in the rate of uh, the temperature. So it's important to notice that uh, with proportional only control, we had some overshoot, but notice that. Um, we are getting to something close to a steady controller output, but that there is not a zero error. In other words, we have uh, we have steadied out at some temperature above zero error. Now, when I introduce some uh, integral action, I'm going to set the reset time to about uh, 40, and we can now see. Also notice that since we're not resetting the integral, we've seen quite a large action all happening at once. Uh, this is only due to the way in which the um, error is uh, being tracked. Uh, because we have live tuning the controller parameters, we'll see a little bit of time before we actually see everything uh, steady out in the normal behavior. Now uh, we'll see the error integral is uh, getting close to zero. Now we have a relatively uh, good set point response over here. And as we zoom into that scale, we can start seeing that uh, this controller is converging on the actual set point. So compare this to the previous response with a much larger tau i, where we could see a similar shape, but uh, with a control offset. Demonstration. During the demonstration, I was going through how that proportional mode, if the gain is too small, so in other words, we, we noticed, so we've been uh, looking just at proportional control, and we noticed that if that is a small number. If I have a small gain, it's clear that 
at least from a conceptual point of view, a large error could lead to a small adjustment. And I think intuitively most of you can understand that if there's a large error and I'm making a small adjustment, I'm probably not going to fix the problem. I need to make an error, I need to make an adjustment that is uh, the correct size for the error that I have. So the smaller the gain, and you can kind of take this all the way down to zero, if the gain is zero, the sensitivity of the controller to the error is zero. And so therefore I can have as large an error as I want, and the controller, remember, deviation variables, output of zero for the controller means do the same thing as you would do it. So, I mean, that's obviously wrong. There's a large error, and the controller is still outputting exactly the same output as before. That can't be right. So the, the controller should be acting to counteract the error that it is seeing. Now, just before I introduce the integral mode, I also just while I've got this uh, nomenclature going, I want to uh, talk about how we talk about the action of controllers. Uh, this is a widely misunderstood, this is the commonly misunderstood thing. Um, why is this? There you go. This is a commonly misunderstood uh, idea. You will see that in the textbook they distinguish between direct acting controllers and reverse acting controllers. And then we also have positive gain controllers and negative gain controllers. I find it's easier to remember the direct and reverse acting terminology when you refer to the direction in which the measurement is moving. And so if you think about our little temperature control loop, if we have our TC lab over here, right? The manipulated variable that we have in our TC lab, right, is such that it causes an increase in the temperature when it is large. So increasing Q will tend to increase T. And so we know what that means. That means that this has a positive gain. That's the case for TC lab. Now you can understand that temperature control a temperature controlled system doesn't have to work this way. It could be that there is a fan and when I turn on the fan the temperature goes down. In a system like this where we have something like an air conditioning system and most of the time we're trying to get the temperature to go down, again turning on or increasing the action of the air conditioner is going to decrease the temperature. And so both of these versions of controlled systems exist. There are Things where when you open the valve, the thing you're trying to control goes up. And there are things that when you open the valve, the thing that you're trying to control goes down. Just positive and negative gain, no problem so far. Now we're going to hook that up. Now we're going to hook this up to a control system. And I'm going to draw this control system just like I did before. Uh, kind of drawing a box around the controller, and I'm not going to draw the, the subtraction, the error calculation, and so on. I'm just going to say, if I have a controller box like this, from the point of view of that box, imagine things are OK. In other words, we're at a point, we're at some steady state. We are outputting not a zero Q, but a Q which is causing that steady state. So let's say uh, during tutorial one, you remember that we had that task, just get it to 40 and just get it to stay there, right? That's a non-zero Q, but it's a steady state. In deviation variables, all the signals are zero. And at a particular moment in time, something happens. Something happens in such a way so that the temperature goes up. What is the controller supposed to do in that case? We can reason through that without much math. We can say, right, if the temperature, if, we're, if everything is fine now, and the temperature becomes positive in deviation variables, in other words, it has gone up from where it was, 
the correct action from the controller would be to reduce Q. Right? And this is described as a direct acting controller. In other words, the action is in the, uh, sorry, it is a reverse acting controller. It is in the opposite direction of temperature, right? So the temperature goes up, the action goes down, reverse acting. If this were a cooled system, if the output were cooling the system, if the temperature went up, I would have to kind of decrease the cooling, right? So I would have had to actually take Q, uh, Q up or the manipulated variable to the air conditioner up. So this is like, let's say, if this goes up, right, this must go down. So that's how the TC lab works. This is a reverse acting controller. Why? Because these signs are different. In terms of what the desired behavior is. If the temperature that I'm measuring is too high, I must reduce my output. So this is, let's say, reverse action. If this was cooling water, right? If that was cooling water going to some jacketed reactor, in that case, we have a negative gain. Does everybody see how that works, right? So if I've got cooling water, more cooling water will make the temperature go down, right? So I've got a negative gain system, and Now, the desired result, if the temperature goes up, I want the cooling water to go up. And therefore, I want a direct action controller. It's important to realize that most of this terminology was developed from a time before electronic controllers existed. So this idea of a, a reverse acting and a direct acting controller actually comes from this thing called a what governor, which I don't know if any of you have ever seen a what governor. Uh, you, you have seen one. You probably just didn't know that you were looking at one. Um, a what governor is a thing that was developed to control steam systems. So this is a device that looks something like this. You've seen these, I think, if you've ever, if you've ever seen videos of steam engines. This, there's a shaft over here that turns, and there are uh, balls attached to so this is a vertical thing with these balls connected to, uh, to uh, linkages. And as that uh, shaft goes faster, these balls experience a uh, centripetal force. So you can imagine that if the shaft doesn't rotate very fast, the balls hang down. And as you spin it faster, the balls have a tendency to swing upwards, right? And so actually, this is, a, this is, this is the mechanism uh, this would then be, that linkage would then be connected through a variety of, of uh, linkages to a steam valve, <coughs> right? And you can see here, this is the kind of thing that you would need to control the speed at which a steam engine rotates, right? Which says, if it's going too fast, close the valve. So. And what is that? That action is a reverse action, right? So it's like engine speed too high, steam must close. Okay. <clears throat> 
So the confusing part, so this is now, in terms of action, that makes a lot of sense, right? So it says, well, how do I hook this thing up? When the shaft goes faster, I want to close the steam, so it's got to go in the opposite direction. That makes a lot of sense, right? It becomes confusing when we now include, uh, so this is direct action. And I know this is confusing. You'll even find me slipping from time to time, right? Because, like, the words are very close to each other. Um, because the difficulty is that in the standard control diagram, remember, we've got our reference set up in this way where I'm calculating an error. And now you've got to ask yourself, what is the gain that I need in the controller to make this happen? And this is where the confusing thing comes in. Because if my temperature is too high, remember this is what I was saying, in both cases, we, we started out fine. We started out at steady state, at set point. My temperature was then suddenly too high. And the problem is that when the temperature is too high, the error is negative, right? Because remember, if YSP is staying the same, it's zero in deviation variables. And so I was OK. At some point, something weird happened, and now the temperature is too high. This is what these signs mean, just to be clear, right? Um, it, it can be useful to draw these slightly differently, to draw these as what happens if that happens? In other words, if the signal is increasing or starts increasing, how will that work through? Okay? But uh, as long as you have in your mind a pretty good idea of what's going on, suddenly the temperature is too high. Now the error is negative. And it depends on the gain of the system what the gain of the controller must be. But notice that in the positive gain case, Okay, I'm, I'm getting there. I've got a question on Slack about like how the gain works. Uh, I just want to go through to the gain of the controller, and then we'll talk about the gain of the system. So in the case of a positive gain, gain system, if the temperature is high, we want to change the uh, manipulated variable to go down, right, or to get smaller, which means that uh, in the reverse acting case, confusingly, the controller gain is positive. Right? How do I know the controller gain is positive? Because I need to get from a negative to a negative. Remember, so the temperature is too high, which means the error is negative. I need to make it negative. I need to make the output negative. So what do I need? I just need a positive gain. Right? And in the direct acting case, again confusingly, direct acting controllers have negative control again. But it, it makes sense when you understand with reference to what are we talking about direct action, right? It's about this, it, those terminologies were developed before we developed these comparators. When you just look at the controller, you're like, okay, the thing that goes into the controller, which is the measurement, when that goes up, I want the controller thing to go down. That's reverse action. When the thing that goes in, the measurement, goes down, I want that thing to go up. That's, that's a reverse action. So the reverse is about what's happening to the measurement and how the measurement relates to the output. That's how you kind of figure it out. The controller gain, when we do analysis, when we start thinking about it mathematically, the controller gain is about the difference between the error and the... Is that even visible? I'm sorry about that. That's like super hard to see. Uh, so let's just make sure that everybody sees there. So that's now, that has now become negative. 
to get to a negative to a positive, I need a negative sign, right? To get from a negative to a negative, I need a positive sign. And so, here's the thing to understand about the gains and the actions, okay? When we talk about direct acting controllers, we're talking about measurement to output. When we're talking about gain of controllers, we're talking about error to controller output. And confusingly, they are different. You can kind of remember, it's actually weirdly easy. It's easier to remember that they are the opposite than it is to actually go and figure out all the gains. Uh, so for me, for my money, it's easiest to remember that kind of if you, if you know how action works, that kind of makes sense. And then you just remember the reverse gain idea. So you just remember that, oh, yes, well, direct acting controllers need negative gain uh, controller gains. While direct acti uh, reverse acting controllers uh, have positive gains. Now... You can kind of see why we've set things up the way that we have because most of the time, if you've normalized stuff in such a way so that if your system is normal, quote unquote normal, positive gain system, you'll need a normal, quote unquote normal, positive gain controller <coughs> if you put it inside of this standard control scheme because it's a reasonable question to ask, like, why are the signs the way they are? Why are we taking the reference as positive and the error and the measurement as negative? Remember, it would work the same way. We could get a functionally equivalent system if we just used a different convention. If we just said, well, we'll always subtract the set point from the measurement. It, that, that convention is just as functional as the one that we use now. Um, and it would actually make it so that direct acting controllers have positive gains. Uh, it's kind of a choice to just make the normal positive gain case positive gain all around the loop. Right? So, does everybody understand this whole direct reverse? Because I, I, I know it's super confusing and the book doesn't go very far to explain. Like, it just states, oh, this is how it is. I'm hoping that this will give you a little bit more insight into kind of why are those names so weirdly chosen uh, and why, uh, why we would need a reverse or direct acting controller. Now, just as a, as a kind of a, a practical point, you'll, you'll remember in, on Monday I showed you, well, no, sorry, on Tuesday I showed you that picture of an actual controller. And that particular controller and like, like a lot of temperature controllers, they'll actually have on the back they'll have effectively a direct acting and a reverse acting output. So if you wire something into the heating output, that will be the reverse acting one. And if you wire something into the cooling output, that will be the direct acting one. And uh, so a lot of times why you would like to know the, the action of the controller is that, again, on the box, there's no sign to the game, right? Uh, many controllers have a switch on the front that allows you to switch between direct and reverse action, acting, but very few controllers actually have a signed gain. So it's, it's, it's unlikely, unless you have like something that's quite focused on simulation uh, of Laplace systems or whatever, if it's, if it's meant to look like an actual control box, it probably won't have a sign on the gain. The gain slider will just be a knob or something that goes from zero all the way to kind of a large number. And you'll have a, you'll have a switch or something, or you'll wire it differently if you want it to be direct or reverse. So it's important to understand there's this problem where the math is actually not exactly the way the real world works. So here, for the first time, there's quite a big difference between kind of these diagrams that we're drawing that represent the controllers and how controllers are actually constructed. And you'll see this weird difference. Because there's less agreement about the math, there's much more stuff to remember. <laughs> so we, we have very little differences in terms of the differential equations. How do you write that down? But we've got lots of different choices. Every, every manufacturer made different choices. One manufacturer th thought that it would be a good idea to have a switch. Another one, you know, thought it would be easier to construct if you just had two outputs. 
So you kind of have to roll with all those different vagaries. And there's no one uniquely defined optimal way to do this. Right. So, okay. Now we're starting to think about, and I want you to also just remember that in the vast majority of cases, it's a trap for the unwary in this, in this textbook that most of the examples of all of the things are positive gain systems with positive gain controllers. So it's quite easy to imagine that negative gain controllers do not exist. However, they do in fact exist. <laughs> Um, and you have to remember that, like the upper part of this diagram, if you think about, if, if you look at what this looks like here, right, what I've drawn here, the standard control proportional gain, what is that? That's a positive gain controller. Is that the only way these diagrams look? No. There is a 100% equivalent version of that diagram, which is for a negative gain controller that has its slope reversed. And that's perfectly fine. That's exactly normal. It's also a controller. It's also a proportional controller. It just happens to have a negative gain. These diagrams confuse people in a second way, which is I'm now going to switch over to, um, to this notebook. And this time I'm actually going to try and have sound. Right, okay, so it's confusing to a lot of people that there are um, these two different kinds of diagrams. There's this diagram, which shows the error output relationship at steady state for a controller. And then there's this other class of diagrams, which have the controller output over time in the open loop mode. So this is the controller output of a PI control. So that's P over time. Hmm. Right. Okay, well that's interesting. Can I do two? It does look like it. Okay, awesome. Okay, so that is, uh, that is a PI controller over time, the output of a PI controller over time, if I just have a step in the error, what will that controller do? This is what you're seeing here. It is important to realize that you are not looking at this controller actually controlling a system. Right? This is the controller not connected to a system. It is the step response of a PI controller. Just like we did step responses uh, last year in CPN, this is just a step response of the controller by itself. The reason for this is that the, we build these controllers, we're going to say, okay, let's think conceptually this is what a game controller, this is what it would look like. Let's add a couple of things, let's add integral action, that's what it would look like. This is what the step response of the controller would look like. And only a little bit on in the textbook do we then uncover what these things look like when you actually connect them to a system. And so a lot of you are looking at that and like, that is not at all like the stuff that Cole was showing on Wednesday. Carl was showing on Wednesday these kind of smooth curves. They were changing, oscillating over time, eventually getting to a set point. This looks nothing like that. And the reason is it's not connected. It's not actually connected to the system. It is just the thing by itself. And so you'll see many of these diagrams in the textbook. And hopefully I have, I have completed the set here in this notebook. So you can actually go through and play around with this, um, it's hopefully obvious to everybody that the, ver that the step response of a pure gain controller, let me, let me move this up, oh, wait. 
Okay, so these are the step responses of controllers, right? Just straight controllers. A proportional controller is just a game. So its step response is not very exciting, right? It is, uh, if this is a unit step, then that number is just the gain of the controller. A PI controller contains this integrating action, right? And that integrating action means that after that initial bump, I also see uh, an integral. Now, it's useful, you'll see that we have this, so let's say uh, P, this is P over time. So remember, we've got something like this in deviation variables. We've just got p is equal to ke. And over here, we've got p is equal to k, kc1 plus 1 over tau i s e. So these are the transfer functions of those of those systems. So we've got a proportional uh, we've got a proportional controller and we've got an integral or a proportional integral controller. And hopefully everybody can look at that and say yes, that that kind of if I add those two step responses together, the step response of of an integral system, if you can remember this from from last year, the step response of an integrator is just a ramp. Right? So if I have a step response of, if I have a step coming into an integrator, I'll get a ramp coming out of it. And then finally, if we, if we want to say uh, PID, a realistic PID controller, well, let's say a realistic PD controller looks rough, something like this. Now, we don't actually have the ability to build derivative controllers as we discussed on Wednesday because of physical realizability, right? Because we actually can't calculate the derivative exactly. Remember, the step response of a derivative unit by itself, so if I put this thing into this thing, the output is this thing. Okay? Does that ring a bell, right? So the derivative of the step is like this perfect Dirac delta. You've got to kind of be with me with the C, uh, CPM. Not going to recap that again, okay? So remember that taking the derivative of the step moves you up the table. And so steps derivative is this infinite step. And that's kind of a good way of understanding why we can't build one. Right? Because we can't build a device that will output an infinitely large output for an infinitely small amount of time. Those infinite, infinite is usually a clue, infinite is close to impossible, right? Like in engineering terms. If you say, oh no, that's fine, you just need an infinite like capacity for this, like that actually means it's not fine. It actually means you can't do it. So what do we do? We get close. Right? So you can see that this this big peak over here is kind of an approximation of an infinitely high peak. So it's big, and the bigger it is, the closer we get to infinity. And the shorter that little response time is, the closer we get to infinity. Okay, so, and we can show that this is how the math works out. Uh, again, just a reminder that this is all on, uh, on the repository, so you can kind of do this on your own time. I'm using the control library here because um, the Laplace transform of those derivative units is not very well behaved when you have those very small time constants. So uh, it's a lot easier to get a reliable, nice output out of the control library. Um, and so you can see what I'm doing. This equation should look familiar. That is exactly the same equation that I just drew. Uh, for the PI controller, and you can see that we can get that step response reliably out of the control library. Same thing goes uh, for, well, let's say PD first, right? So there's PD, that's the one that I drew just a minute ago. 
And obviously P and I and D are just the proportional and the integral and the derivative actions all added together. So importantly, we talk about these step responses, and that's the graphs that, like actually most of the graphs showing uh, controller outputs um, are like that in the, in the book. So if you look at like something like figure 7.6, for instance, it's showing the, this confusing graph, or this graph that appears to confuse many students. Because they're looking at that and like, well, I'm not really understanding how that relates to the, the stuff that I've seen controllers do. And it's key to understand that these graphs are what is known as open loop graphs. So it's called open loop because we don't have any of the feedback bits, right? So you'll remember, we talk about this part as the forward part, right? And here we're talking about the open loop response. I would describe these graphs as, firstly, the step response of the controller. That's perfectly fine. I would also describe it as the open loop response of that controller to error. Open loop, why? Because we don't have any feedback connected. There's no result from that controller. It's not connected to a system. It's not measuring. It's not calculating a new error. It, the loop has not been closed. And so you'll see this come up a lot in the discussion in the textbook. You'll see people talking about open loop responses, in which case they always mean, pretty much always mean, that the controller isn't actually running. It's not actually doing the thing that we think of a controller doing. It's not doing the measurement. It's not calculating new outputs. It's not actually doing that whole feedback loop thing. Somewhere along the line, somebody has disconnected something. Either disconnected the temperature or disconnected the output or something like that. You can think about any time you close that or open that loop by breaking a line. And you can do that all the way through, right? So you could every time... Uh, if you disconnected that line, or that line, or that line, in all three of those cases, the controller wouldn't function the way that you expect, where it's actually kind of responding to new measurements, right? Because it's just working in this open loop mode. So what does it look like when we do closed loop? Now, just before I move on to the closed loop responses, any questions about this? Does this clear up some of the stuff that you saw in the textbook? when you were reading through these different responses, please note, and I'm going to say this again, I am not going to, like, if you do not read the textbook, you will fail the subject. What I mean by that is, if you are in every single class, but you do not read the textbook, you will not know the things I expect you to know in class, or in the text. This is just a fact. So I'm assuming you're reading through the textbook, you're having very little difficulty. Everything is super clear, right? I'm relying on you to ask questions, to clarify things. If many people ask questions, I will clarify them in class. That's how this works, right? So you cannot, please remember, you cannot just be in class in this module. You have to read the reading. If you don't read the reading, you will be significantly behind, and there will be many things that you just don't know. So what does a closed-loop response look like? I've built a couple of different notebooks. The first one is uh, the one that I showed you on Wednesday, which is actually hooked up to a, PI, uh, to a TC lab. But um, if you don't want to do this in real time, you can also simply uh, calculate the closed loop response mathematically. Now, for right now, I'm going to ask you to... Uh, ignore, just not forever, just for this lecture, the mechanics of how I'm calculating the Laplace transform of the closed loop. If it confuses you, if you can't understand any of the pictures without looking at the math, just skip ahead to study theme 2. This is where we'll actually do this math. In study theme 2, we talk about the derivation of the feedback control loop. I'm not going to go into it now because I'm working more on building intuition here. So I want to have good intuition before we start just like solving everything with math. Um, 
the nice thing about being able to calculate a closed loop response and have it uh, interactive like this is, you'll remember, I spoke for something like 15 minutes yesterday waiting for two different changes in the controller to kind of become apparent what actually happened. Right? I started with a large-ish gain and then I made the gain small and we talked and talked and talked and then eventually we saw it wasn't actually getting there. You'll see, you'll learn to, you probably already do, but you'll learn to hate your TC lab for how slow it is, even though it's actually quite a fast system. It's, for me, the biggest benefit of being able to do the math is being able to see these results instantly instead of having to kind of try something and see what happens. Simulation is fine, and even like real-time simulation is fine, but the problem is that it takes a long time. It really does. If you look at how quickly I can gain insight here, now look at what I'm doing. This is a first order system which is under proportional control. And let me just, even here, this is not perfect. Let's just give it some time. And what we see is when the gain is small, okay, when the gain is small, here I'm using a gain of three. When the gain is small, the output actually doesn't ever reach the set point. And what we're looking here is this is the set point, right? So this is what I want the controller to do. This is the output, this is what the system is doing. And this is the controller action. And now notice here, the initial response is going from zero up to one, in this case. Okay, that's the initial response of the controller. Then, as this system responds, think about what's happening. The error is getting less, and therefore, the action is getting less, right? So the, the, the biggest error is right at the beginning. The controller is doing the right thing. It's opening up that valve or whatever. Or, uh, it's adding more energy. Now the system starts heating up. And as it starts heating up, the controller relaxes a bit. And the problem with proportional control is that the controller actually will eventually find a point which is not zero error, where the action no longer increases, but the error is still constant. We can fix this to some extent by making the gain larger and larger. And you can see that actually for this system, a very large gain like this actually succeeds in getting really, really close to the error, to the set point. We'll see in study theme two that there are practical bounds uh, and theoretic bounds on the size of the game. We spoke about that on Wednesday, or sorry, on Tuesday. The practical bounds are no manipulated variable can open up to infinity. So when I have this very big gain, I may just slam open the valve all the way and just stay there. So the actual practical gain may be smaller than the gain that I put into the machine. The second problem we'll start seeing when we start using higher order systems. For higher order systems, a large gain can drive the system to instability. And we'll be asking questions about how to calculate those limits next week. So I would like you to play with this proportional control notebook Play with your TC Lab and the PID notebook. We'll be doing a, TI, a, a, a like a project thing uh, on Tuesday's lecture, so be sure that you're kind of aware of how it works. Um, remember to do the reading, and we'll be talking more about the derivative mode in Monday's lecture. So if you have questions about like exactly how that filter works, for instance, we'll be doing that on Monday.
think that that's completely compulsory. You know, it's up to you. If you leave and come back, that's fine. Uh, is it uh, 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 Git at the beginning or at the end? Or? I'm going to start with Git. Okay. So it's going to be Git at the beginning and then like data stuff towards the end. Um, it's not clear to me exactly how long that's going to be. It's like probably at least two hours. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's like it's not sure. It's more of kind of um, it's an attempt for me to kind of trim down on the amount of times I have to do that same thing. But like I'm really just um, keeping feedback. So. I'm just going to keep talking until people get okay. But no, I've got a lot to talk about. So it may be three hours.